Well, good morning. It's great to be here worshiping together. See if you guys are, are, are a little bit more um, appreciative of this than the 830 service was. Who am I? Help, help, I'm in the whale. Who am I? Who am I? No, Joseph, we're in the south. Okay. Um, the whale? Well, never mind. Okay, never mind. Must be the joke. Um, anyway. Well, good morning. It's good to be here in this special place as we come to worship together. Even David didn't like it. I know I bombed. Okay. Um, but uh, we are so glad that you are here this, this morning. If you would help us out with a couple things. Um, if you would text to that number that you're here and listing those who are here in your, in your group, in your family group. If um, you're watching at home, do me a favor. Don't just put, hey, we're here, we're here, we're here on the comment lines of Facebook. Go ahead and text to this number if you would. That, that's what we use to check um, roles, so to speak, kind of see who's here. We also use that um, if there's any need ever for contract, contact tracing, that helps us out too by seeing who's here. So please. And the other thing I just have to say, we've had some other churches in our areas shut down. We're continuing by the grace of God to be able to worship, but we do ask, please wear your mask the whole time you're in worship. So if you're sitting here now and you've taken it off because you've come inside, please put your mask back on and keep it on the whole time. We do require masks the whole time that you're in the service. So please put your mask back on and keep your mask on. That would help us out a whole lot um, just to help um, with that. At the pulpit, we've measured and we're in a different situation or behind the screen. So if you're here without your mask, just put them on. It will be great. Thank you so much for helping us with that. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you to pray about, we are planning on going on a youth retreat finally. We're going this Friday to Caswell. We filled up our original reservation and added another 50% almost of spots, and those are full. We're leaving Friday afternoon. I'm just asking you to pray with me for God to, to work great with that. Um, one of the things is we're planning for the most part outdoor worship. So if you've seen the um, weather forecast, please pray with us for Oak Island this weekend. But you know what? God's going to work it out. And it's going to be great. However, you know, we can think about plans being changed and God's just tweaking it even better for us. And so let's just have that attitude. But I do appreciate your prayers. You need to get your paperwork in. And if you have your paperwork, you need it notarized this morning. Wendy Cato's over there with her notary stuff and she can do that. So that would be a great blessing to get those on in. Also, Operation Christmas Child is in full swing. We still have a few boxes in the back to pick up. So if you haven't gotten one yet, get one or three, fill them up, bring them back next Sunday. Put them on the platform, pray over them as you put them down this front part of the altar. And if you would leave the aisles on the sides open when you bring them next week so anyone coming up can use the rails if necessary. But bring them back. Our deadline is again next week, Sunday, November 15th. Speaking of Christmas, there are still some opportunities to serve with our Sounds of Christmas. It's Christmas coming up. Before you know it, it will be here. So just contact Dr. Russ, if you would, to um, see where you can help. And what a great blessing to be able to do that. We have also had something going on that we've had at least three rounds of it um, called Farmers to Families. It's a food box ministry. Well, we have been approved for round four of that. On, and it begins this week. We'll pick up 110 boxes this Thursday with most of the distribution occurring on Saturday morning. We've had approximately 40 of our members involved in some way or another, and we've helped over 100 families in our community with this ministry. So if you would like to join in and help with that, please see Pete Teague, and I believe Pete is in the back helping us back there. So see Pete Teague if you're willing and able and feel called to help us this weekend. You know, we are so thankful for our veterans who have served our country, and we're going to have a short video in just a second to show, show some of the, those who have served and say thank you. What we're going to ask you to do is, if you would, when you hear the song for your branch of the service, if you would stand, remain standing to the end, and even if you don't have a picture in the video, if you serve, go ahead and stand if you would so we could recognize you when that time comes. Okay. 
Carl Morner for putting that together. What a great way of um, saying thank you to those who have served um, and in order in part to help us to be able to do what we're doing right now and that's coming together and worshiping the only one worthy of worship and that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So if you would please join me in prayer at this time for our service. Father God I thank you so much for the opportunity we have to come together and to worship you. Lord, we thank you for freedoms that are preserved and for those that fought in our fighting to preserve them. But Lord, above all, we thank you for you providing our opportunity for worship, for you being the only one worthy, worthy of worship, and for you allowing our worship to not just be something we do, but something that we live. Father God, I pray for the service that you are glorified. I pray that we would see you face to face during this time. Lord, I pray especially for your messenger, our pastor, that you would just pour through him in the power of the Holy Spirit the message you have given him. And Lord, let it touch our lives. And Lord, let us leave here a changed people to be changing people. Lord, again, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, this opportunity to worship. We give it all to you, for you're the only one who is worthy. And we ask this in that beautiful, precious, and lovely name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Let us all stand as we read God's word. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. He is my God, and the rock I run to for protection. Oh Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You may be seated. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy
Amen. Take your Bibles with me this morning and tur turn to the book of Jonah, chapter number one. Jonah, chapter number one. If you've lived any time at all with Jesus, then you have asked the question, why, Lord? Now, maybe you haven't said that out loud, but you have said that in your heart or in your mind. Why are these things happening to me? And many times we find that there's no reason that we can understand as to why difficult things are happening. But on the other hand, sometimes there is. Sometimes we're experiencing the consequences of someone else's sins. Someone else has done something and we've run into that. Other times, maybe more than we think, we're experiencing the consequences of our own sins. You know, sometimes we've allowed our sinful desires or sinful thoughts or perspectives to so dominate our lives that we end up running from the Lord. And that's exactly what happened to Jonah. He stands not only as a man guilty of disobeying the Lord, but also as a man who represents all mankind in our struggle with our own sense of right and wrong, our own sense of what we want to do or not do in this world. You know, maybe you're struggling right now with something that God has wanted you to do for a while, maybe a long while. And we learned last week that you cannot run from God and also that our sins will find us out. This week, we find that when they do, if we're God's children, God will deal with us. So I invite you to read with me from Jonah chapter 1 in the last verse of that chapter, which is verse number 17. And then we'll continue on into chapter 2. So Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me, and all your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out to dry land. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, we thank you that, God, you are the God who is sovereign. Father, that you and you alone know all things. And, Father, we pray this morning that that knowledge would both comfort us, but also, God, that it would admonish us. That, Lord, we would be mindful that 
You know all things about us and it would draw us close to you. And Lord, we pray, Father, this morning that you would speak through your servant Jonah once again and that we would see not only Jonah, but we would see our own selves. But more importantly than any of that, God, we would see you. And that we would allow you to have your will and way in our lives. And we ask for that in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. We said last week that the test of where we are truly in our walk with the Lord is not revealed by what we do when God asks us to do something we agree with. You know, it's, it's easy to do what we like, isn't it? It's easy to volunteer for something when it's something that we enjoy doing. It's more difficult or challenging to us to volunteer when it's something that we don't like or we don't enjoy doing. Much less when God commands us to do something that we really don't agree with or that we will really don't like. That's what reveals where we're at with our walk with God. But isn't that the ultimate prayer? The ultimate example of the Lord Jesus Christ? Didn't he say, not my will, but thy will be done? That's exactly where Jonah found himself. He was going about his daily life and his daily ministry, apparently, as content as he could be. And all of that changed when God told him to go to Nineveh and preach against their sins. The Ninevites were Gentiles of the Assyrian nation. They were wicked in the sight of many nations and apparently abhorrent in the eyes of Jonah. He could not believe God wanted him to go there. Not only could he not believe it, he absolutely refused to do it. Most of you know the story. Jonah climbed on a boat and he headed as far away uh, from Jerusalem and from the presence of the Lord that he possibly could. We find that God had caused a great storm to come upon the sea. And that God revealed to the sailors of that vessel the cause of the storm... And that cause was Jonah. But rather than obey the Lord and get his relationship right, Jonah was willing to be thrown overboard into the ocean so that the ship and its passengers might be safe. Now that brings us to the end of chapter 1 and to the introduction to chapter 2, which is found in verse number 17 of chapter 1. And here's what we said again. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now there it is. There is one of the most famous sentences in all the Bible right there. One of the most memorable things that has been said. It's famous. And this verse is the part of the story that most people remember more than all the rest. Jonah... And the whale. Now, we, we can't ignore the whale in the room, can we? Right? We can't ignore the whale in the room. And we shouldn't. But let me ask you a question. Was it really a whale? Is that what the Bible said? That's not what the Bible said, is it? The Bible said it was a great fish. Now, let me just give you a word of exhortation here. It's gone down in history as Jonah and the whale, right? But that's not what the Bible says there. We should teach what the Bible says. And then we can talk about what it means. Now, why do we say it's a whale? We say it's a whale because that's the greatest fish in the sea, right? It's the largest fish that we have. But the Bible doesn't say a whale, so our young people ought to understand that the Bible doesn't say a whale. And then we ought to have the conversation, well, we believe that that 
was a well. See, Pastor Darren, why is that so important? Because if we if we don't pay attention to the particulars in things like these, we may not pay attention to the particulars in other things. Just an, just a word of encouragement there. Um, we kind of get fixed on the well, though, don't we? I mean, we remember the well when in reality, listen to me, there is something far more important that we should see and remember from that verse. Not the great fish, but the great God who prepared the fish. You see, all the things that have transpired have taken Jonah by surprise. His spiritual vision had been dimmed by his disobedience. And he was therefore surprised at everything that was happening. He was surprised that God had commanded him to go to this city of Nineveh. He couldn't believe that. That took him by surprise. He was surprised now that uh, the events that happened on the, the boat that were unfolding before him... Uh, were happening in a way he never anticipated. This surprised him. You see, Jonah had a plan. Jonah decided, hey, I'm not going to do what God says. I'm not going to go to those people. I'm going to go the total opposite direction that I possibly can. I've got money. I can get on a boat. I can get away. And so he jumped on the boat. He went and he planned to go as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could. But uh, now... His plans were being overthrown. And matter of fact, he was about to be thrown over the side of the boat. The sailors that are on there, the other passengers that may have been there, they were surprised by what was taking place. God, however, was not surprised. God was prepared. No matter what is going on in our life, we've got to remember this truth. God knows and God is prepared. Psalm 139 is a passage I'd encourage you maybe to jot down and, and read later. I'm going to read now for you from it. Beginning in verse number one, the Bible says this, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? There is no thought that you have had that God does not know. There is no deed that you have done that God is unaware of. There is no word that you have spoken that God has not heard and there is no place that you or I can go and hide from the presence of the Lord God knew what Jonah was going to do before Jonah ever did it listen to me nothing takes God by surprise you say Pastor Darren how does that work I don't know But that's what God's word says, and I have found that to be true in my life. And by the way, you better be thankful for that. You see, we get surprised by a lot of things, don't we? There's things that happen that we're unprepared for. And when that happens, we tend to react. Right? We tend to react. You know what a reaction is? And it's an immediate uh, it's an immediate action in, based upon another person's action, situation, or circumstance. Now, if you've lived in a home with other sinners, and I think everybody here has, then what you find out is when you become surprised about things uh, and you react, 
a lot of times your reaction is what we call a knee-jerk reaction, right? That's, a, that's an immediate action without thought. And it tends to be damaging. Damaging to relationships, sometimes damaging to you. We tend to react and it's not very pretty. God doesn't react, thank the Lord. You ever heard the saying, what if God woke up on the wrong side of the bed that morning? Or what if God got in a bad mood? Hey, listen, by the way, God doesn't sleep. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He doesn't need to. And nothing takes him by surprise, which means God doesn't react rashly to anything. He doesn't have to. See, our God is a God that is prepared because he knows. He's always prepared. By the way, this gray fish, we're gonna, we'll say the whale. We, we, we believe that to be a whale. You know, there's a lot of people that have spent their entire life trying to prove that the Bible isn't true. And so they've studied whales and they've said it's impossible for whales, even the large whales, to be able to swallow Jonah. But see, they're, they're, not, they're discounting what God says here. The Bible says that God prepared the fish. See, this fish was God made for Jonah. It was a fish tailored for the life of Jonah. A one of a kind fish that God had prepared to be able to do what it did. The fish was made for this purpose. Now, how long do whales live? A long time. A long time. Listen, God, God allowed this fish to be born and he prepared it long probably before Jonah ever was born himself. This fish's existence was there because God willed it to be there. God made the fish able to do what this fish would do. This fish could do what no other fish could do. You say, how in the world does that happen? Because the fish belongs to God just like the water belongs to God. Amen? The water belongs to God. The boat belongs to God. The world belongs to God. You belong to God. I belong to God. Everything belongs to God. I often say when Jesus stepped out of the boat onto the water... He said the water was, he made the water. He, he had, he, I mean, he, he made it chemically, he made it molecularly, everything, it was fluid. And that, and that was of, according to the design of God. But guess what? When God stepped out and he said, hey, I'm going to take a walk. And he said, you know, to the water, be firm. The water said, yes, sir. Why? Because it's his water. He made it and it will do whatever he tells it to do. We need to get that. Because some of you are sitting here this morning and, everybody, and there, there's some tore up. Right? There's a lot of people tore up. By the way, could you sense any stress in me this morning? We're tore up because, well, the vote didn't go the way we wanted or the election didn't go the way we wanted or the people didn't get the people didn't get What in the world are we going to do? Listen, it took us by surprise, but it did not take God by surprise. Salvation does not come from Washington. Never has. Never will. See, Pastor Darren, what are we supposed to do? Trust that our God is prepared and obey him. What does our Lord say? Pray for those that lead you. Pray for them. Honor them. Respect them. You say, well, I'm not going to respect them. Then you're not going to respect God. You need to get right with God. Heaven's throne is not Washington, D.C. God is prepared. We got to trust Him. Because well, guess what? God made it all. Got nothing, nothing can stop God from accomplishing His will. The only things that, that keep God from accomplishing His will in our lives is us. The only thing that was a keeping God from accomplishing his will with Jonah was Jonah. Jonah's attitude was in there. Jonah's upset. Jonah's sense of right and wrong. Jonah's sense of what he wanted to see happen and what he did not want to see happen. We're living Jonah right now. And I'm just kind of amazed because when God lined all this out for me, I really wasn't thinking about an election. But God was. God is prepared. That fish was, it was not only created for Jonah, it was there exactly when God wanted it to be. God had guided the fish to be present in the waters where Jonah was. Jonah got to be thrown over and guess what? The fish didn't have to wait and come get him. 
Have you ever seen those videos where the, fish, where the whales breach beside the boat and everybody's surprised? Man, that would scare me to death if some big old thing comes up out. You know what? I, I'll imagine in my head. Now, this is Lambert 101, so you've got to be careful with it. But I see this in my head where he throws, you know, they sling Jonah over. And next thing you know, this will whoosh. Say, Pastor Aaron, how do you know that? Because they got on their knees and prayed afterwards. Amen. I'm just seeing that in my head that way. That fish was there because it was God's fish. You know, when we board our boats and seek to flee from his presence, God knows and he's prepared. God also knows when the regular things of life beat against our boats and threaten to turn us over, spilling us into the deep darkness. He's prepared for that too. He knows where we're at personally. By the way, God knows exactly where you and I are right now. He knows where we're at, where we're at as a church family. He knows where we're at as a nation. And he knew we would be here right now at this time. And God is prepared. We take comfort in that truth. We claim it often. But we cannot ignore the other side of that truth. Which is when our hearts are out of sync with God. And our heads are caught up in our own pride and sin. God knows and God is prepared. But there's something else. As we move into chapter 2, we learn another powerful truth. God is not only prepared, he is prepared to do whatever is necessary to bring us back to him. Look in verse number 1 of chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. There's that word that we don't like. Affliction. We don't like to hear it. Much less experience it. But look at Jonah's experience and see the afflicting hand of God upon him. Verse number three. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down into the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. God uses affliction. So here we find this duality of experience. Jonah is suffering affliction. Now think about this. We have these cartoons that we watch and these stories that we tell and these pictures that we show our kids where, you know, Jonah's like camped out in the well and he's got a little fire going, you know, and he's thinking about and pondering his life. Please be careful with Oscar Mayer theology. B O L O G N A. That's baloney. Doesn't exist that way. Listen, the scripture says, weeds are wrapped around my head. Why would any man leave weeds wrapped around his head? Because he couldn't get his hands there to pull them off. I don't believe Jonah was sitting camped out, you know, sitting on some part of a whale's rib, you know, thinking about things with Jesus. I, you know, it, it seems like he could not even clear the, the, the garbage off of his head. That he was bound, if you will. That he was being taken to the depths of the sea. To the bottom of the ocean. To the, he said to the very moorings underneath the mountains where they're formed. He said, God, you've taken me so far away from everything that I've ever known. God's afflicting hand is upon him. You talk about utter darkness. I don't think we've ever been in a darker place than what Jonah was. The absence of total light. He's there for three days and three nights. You know what that tells me? Jonah was stubborn. Yes, does God use affliction? Are some of the things that come into our lives because God is allowing us to be afflicted because of our sinful thoughts, actions, and desires? Absolutely. Because God's willing to do whatever is necessary to bring his children close to him. 
By the way, parents, I know our kids get grown and they go out and we lose the ability to do what we want to do in, able to, in order to keep them close to us or close to the Lord. But let me ask you a question. If you could, wouldn't you? Absolutely. We'd do whatever we could do. We're just limited beings. We can only do so much. They grow up and they go away. We can't do anything about that except trust God. Amen. But guess what God can do? Everything. Everything. Nothing is withheld from the Lord. So does affliction come into our lives? Yes. But whose fault is it? Ours. Did Jonah have to experience affliction? No. Jonah could have chosen to obey, to submit himself, but he did not. And a lot of times we don't. And we don't even see it. Jonah didn't want to look at it. We don't want to look at it. We want to blame anything and everything that we could possibly blame over there. But affliction comes because sometimes God needs to allow us to suffer in order for us to gain some sense. God uses affliction. He does whatever it takes to keep his, bring his children home. But you know what? Thirdly, what we've got to do is we've got to receive God's discipline and love and allow it to work in us. We have to receive God's discipline in love and allow it to work in us. Many times, God brings conviction and we resist the conviction from the Lord. We seek to put it out of our mind with other things. Listen to me, it's no mistake that we live in a day and age where we, we're running out of time every day, aren't we? How, how many times, so there's just not enough hours in the day. There's just not, a, you know, we have, we get beautiful homes and we have, you know, beautiful yards and we've got, you know, all the, the, all the toys and the tools that we want to play with, but we never play with them, do we? Why? Because we're always so busy. We always have so much to do. No, you don't. No, you don't. We're allowing ourselves to be driven that, that fast. We're allowing ourselves. We're buying in to the narrative of our nation that we have to go and we have to do. And our kids have to participate in everything under the sun. And we've got to be a part of everything under the sun. And, and you know, we don't have any time to enjoy life. But it's even more than that. The devil has us on the run because he doesn't want us stopping long enough. To think about our lives. To hear the voice of God. We want to resist that conviction. When we want to put other things in there. Yet it never goes away no matter where we are. Jonah had sought to go as far away from Nineveh and the will of God as he could go. All this had accomplished was to take him as far away from where he wanted to be. To the depths of the sea, Jonah had to go. He had to feel the heavy hand of God upon him in every way possible. But finally, Jonah faced what he had sought to run from. And he allowed God's discipline to work within his very heart. And it reminded him. Of the truth he so desperately needed. Look in verse number 7. And when my soul fainted within me. I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you and to your holy temple. Guess what? Jonah's praying again, isn't he? Jonah's praying once again. And what's he praying about? The very thing we said he had to, to talk to God about. What he didn't want to. He says, I remembered the Lord. One of the, we've been looking on Wednesday nights at spiritual disciplines. And one that we'll get to in a week or two is one I think is critically important. Which is the practice of solitude. Cutting the phones off. Cutting the TVs off. Finding time. Where you're quiet before the Lord and you can hear him. When you can read the word of God and have time to think about it. When your prayer time, you're not only asking God, you're pausing and listening to him speak. Jonah had some alone time. And he remembered the Lord. 
and he began to pray. What was he praying about? The truth of who God is. The truth of who God is. King and creator, Lord and sovereign of the universe. He says in verse 8, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. What's he remembering? There's one true God. There's one true God, one Savior, and his name is Jesus. You see, that, that's, that's the ultimate truth that the devil doesn't want us to pause and think about. Is we have one true God. We know him. We serve him. We have one Savior. God loved us so much that he gave his son. God took flesh and lived among us. And he did what we couldn't do. He, he, he lived perfectly without sin. He conquered death, hell, and sin and the grave for us. He died upon the cross and he shed his blood and he paid for our sins and was buried and he rose from the grave. And that's the gospel and it infuses everything that we do with grace and strength. And that's the last thing that the devil wants us thinking about and remembering. Why? Because when we do, it makes us live differently. Listen, if God loved us so much that he was willing to pay this kind of price... To bring us close. Why do we think God will not do whatever's necessary to pull us back from the dangers and sin of this world? There is one God. There is no other Savior. There is no other hope. But thank God in Him there is hope. Amen. And it is for this reason that Jonah was praying. What do you find? Him remembering God and you find find gratitude and obedience. Look in verse number 9. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. What is he saying? Gratitude. I'm grateful. I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. By the way, I know we can't sing right now. Not loudly. Because I know you're singing, so just keep it quiet. You can't belt it out. You can't touch the rafters. If you do, you get dangerous. I know we can't sing the way we want. That's why every time that we lift our voice, we ought, to, we ought to sing with our whole heart because it's a sacrifice of praise to God. But thanksgiving and obedience go hand in hand because I promise you something. When we stop being obedient, it's because we have ceased to be thankful. Because when we think about Jesus and our Savior and we think about what God has done for us, our heart wells with gratitude. And it changes the way that we look at everything. Man, you can clean a toilet whistling for Jesus. Amen. You say, Pastor Dan, you're you're a kid. No, I know because I did it. I remember when God gave me a job in Bible college, I I lost a job at a box factory because I wouldn't work on Sunday. Because I, I was a, an assistant pastor and they started working seven days a week. We'd been working six days a week for 30 weeks out of the year. And then they decided to go seven and they said, they said it to us this way. They said, listen guys, if you think you can find a better job than what you have here, go ahead and start looking because we're going to seven days. That's just the way it is. If you can find another place where you can have uh, benefits and you can have everything like you got up here, then you go ahead. But see, I committed to, to be an assistant pastor. That was my calling. And by the way, they paid me $40 a week. I couldn't afford to lose that. And the place to say, and the Lord says, uh-uh. He said, you can't do it. And I went to him and told him, I said, I can't do it. I'm sorry. Ah, maybe it'll blow over. And it didn't blow over. Next thing you know, they kept putting me on the schedule because they needed to make an example of somebody. And I remember guys coming up when I didn't show up. And they'd come up and say, hey, man, how come you didn't, you know, you weren't here on Sunday. He goes, I, I know you're an assistant pastor, but I, I'm a Sunday school director. I said, why are they giving you excused absence? I said, they didn't give me an excused absence. They wrote me up. Oh, well, well, I need my job. You know, I can't, can't do that. I'm like, I didn't ask you to, man. It's up to you. You got to do what the Lord wants you to do. And the Lord told me, he says, look, I fed and clothed you before you got here, and I'll feed and clothe you afterwards. And that's exactly what I told him the day that I quit. And God did exactly what he said he would do. I haven't missed any meals. Definitely not lately. Thank y'all.
when we start being grateful and we remember who God is, it changes the way that we live and it changes our perspective on things. And it builds our faith and it fills us with joy and we know that God is in control and we can live that way. And when we do, God does amazing things. He does God things. Gratitude and obedience. What God is, who God is and what he's done for us is our motivation and it keeps us in his command. But you know what? We find within ourselves another truth. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 says this. All we like sheep have gone astray and we've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We have this terrible propensity within us to seek into our own path and to do our own thing and to wander even in the midst of God's blessings. I don't know if you've ever studied about shepherds and sheep, but I've done a little bit of it. The shepherd, periodically, he'll get a sheep that's growing up, and it'll be one that's prone to wander. And that little thing will go, and it'll run off, and, you know, the 90 and 9, the shepherd leaves the one. Well, that one tends to be one that leaves often. And as that sheep will continue to run away and, and go off and leave the safety of the shepherd, it, it is danger. It's in danger. And so the shepherd will find it, and one of those times the shepherd will take it, and very carefully he'll break its leg. And he'll break the leg, and then he'll set it, and he'll bind it and treat it. And from that point, for the next few weeks, everywhere that little sheep goes, it'll go on the, uh, on the shepherd. He'll carry it. He'll carry it everywhere he goes. Everywhere he is, that sheep is because it can't take care of itself. And he'll keep that sheep close and he'll feed it from his hand and he'll take care of it and love it and protect it and, and strengthen it until it can walk again and go. And oftentimes and most of the time, by the time the shepherd is done with that process, that sheep will never leave his side again. Because it's learned the blessing, the benefit, and the love of the shepherd. But sometimes it takes some pain. But the pain is there not out of anger but out of love. Brian said it between the service. I loved it. He said, you can't run from God and you can't outrun God's love. You see, Jonah had experienced the chastisement of the Lord in a severe way. But he had learned. He was ready to obey. And then, and only then, did God lift his hand from Jonah. He says, what did Jonah say? He said, I will pay what I have vowed to the Lord. I'm going to do what I said I would do, which was follow God and preach wherever he said preach. Salvation belongs to God. That's his business. And when he got back to that point, verse number 10, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. There's two ways you could do the will of God. You can do, do the will of God joyfully or with whale, whale vomit. You know, so often we place ourselves at odds with God through our selfishness and our disobedience. Rather than face that truth, we look everywhere and at everyone to find something or someone to blame for what we don't like. What we really need to do is accept the truth that it is us and no one else. It's our own selfishness. It's our own pride. It's our own desires that have, we have followed rather instead of the Lord. We must accept the truth that many times we are where we are because of who we are at that time. And once we do this, we can see the way out. You see, the way out is to allow, just to repent and allow God to make us into who he wants us to be. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know whether you have been living the nominal Christian life, which means, you know, you're worshiping and you're doing some of the things, but pretty much the rest of your week, you just, you're just kind of doing whatever you want and church is a part but God isn't the priority and, and listen to me 
If you don't understand it, I'm going to say that very clearly. There is no other way. I mean, that's the clearest way you're running from God right there. You see, God doesn't take back seat to anybody. Matter of fact, God doesn't say, take shotgun. You ever think, hey, Jesus is my co-pilot? Buddy, you have got it wrong. There's one pilot. There's one pilot seat. And God sits in it. And he doesn't accept anything else. And so often, a lot of the things that are going on in our lives is God just allowing us to experience the consequences of our choices because he's calling us to come back home. You know, the, the greatest danger that they're worried about in COVID right now is that all the people that have gone home and they're worshiping from home, they're never going to return to church. And I can't remember what the statistic or estimation was. What was it, Brian? How many they said wouldn't return? It said maybe 60% of people will never return to church because they've gone home and they won't come back. What an indictment of Christianity. What an absolute indictment of, of Christianity that people would believe that God's people, God, the ones that God has redeemed, saved, justified, blessed, and, and, and that we would, would remain home and not care. What does that say about our nation's evaluation of us? It's sad. That God and his name would be so lightly taken by those who have given everything to. To sit in idle, to sit on the sidelines, to just do a little bit and just let it be a part of our culture. That's not enough for God. God gave everything for us. And he calls us to give ourselves to him. He purchased us. You know what I hope? I hope that God is so glorified because whenever everybody is able to be back and it's safe again, I pray that the churches of America will be flooded once again. That the pews would be even more full than they were before because people have understood the blessing that we've been missing out on because we haven't been able to be together with our brothers and sisters. That it'll mean something to us once again. That this affliction that has happened to us will not have happened in vain. But God would use it like he did in the life of Jonah. He would use it in our lives and it would call us back to repentance and it would call us back home and that we would get serious once again about our faith in Christ so we might once again be able to influence our nation the way that we once did. You want to know why America is where it is? It's because we are where we are. Repentance. Gratitude. These are the things that call us back home. Aren't you glad that God calls? That he's not so angry he would just squash us out no god labors over his children because he loves you and calling you home is for your good and calling me home is for my good because the safest place is when we're walking with the shepherd would you stand with me every head bowed and every eye closed no one looking around just a moment, we'll have the invitation and you'll have an opportunity to respond to God. And Maybe God has just solidified some things in your heart. Maybe you're understanding better than you ever have why some things have been happening. Maybe you see the affliction of our nation and you're understanding that God is using that affliction to call his people to a, a serious and a, and a concentrated walk with him. He's calling us home. He's calling us close. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, man, has God loved you with an everlasting love and he's given your, his son Jesus to pay for your sins. And I invite you to come. Come and accept Christ and allow him to change your life. But believers, I call and ask you, in the name of Jesus, come home. Father, we pray this morning, so grateful for the life of Jonah and allowing us to see, Lord, ourselves in him. Lord, we don't celebrate Jonah in his rebellion against you. We celebrate the God who loved him, 
who went after him with a passion and did what was necessary to call him back. And Lord, we thank you that you are a great God and you're the same God that you were then and that you've manifested yourself and shown yourself through your son, Jesus. So Lord, there is no doubt of your love for your people. And we pray, Father, we would respond to that love, that we would pause and remember our God and be thankful and it would motivate us to repent. It would motivate us to draw close. Lord, to make a new resolve to follow you and to love you with all of our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strength. That our nation and this world might know that we serve the one and only true God who is the everlasting Father, the creator of the universe, and the lover of all men's souls. In the name of Jesus we pray.
story of God dealing with Jonah is such a beautiful reminder that, yes, we can't outrun God, and we can't outrun God's love. And when we finally stop running and say, God, you do it through me, what you wanted to do, it changes the world. And now's the time when what we've heard, what we've, ex we've experienced, not the words of Darren, but the words of God poured through him and through his spirit. When we live those out now, we are world changers. We do that from giving of our time and also of our resources. Offering plates are in the back, and as you go, you can give online continually so that the word of God can continue to flow from this place. It will. We just have the opportunity to be a part of that through our giving. Also, I want to remind you to grab your Operation Christmas Child boxes. Take them, fill them, bring them back next week. But above all, let's dedicate ourselves from this moment forward to allowing God to change the world through us. Jerry Harville is now going to come and close us in prayer for the service and for our giving. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day where we can come to your house and worship. We also thank you for allowing us to live in a great nation where we can come here and worship. Thank you for all the veterans that have served, for those on active duty who are still serving to keep this country great. Lord, you have done so much for us. Now it is our turn to give back to you. Please accept these tithes and offerings and use them to the betterment of thy kingdom. In Christ's name, amen.